Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, at this point, I think it is appropriate that I provide some responses to some of the issues that were raised during the earlier debate by various members. I want to start off, Mr. Speaker, by expressing thanks to all my colleagues who stood up and spoke in support of the bill and expressed their support for it. Um, I think the member from Srozel, um, Salty was on the other side. I'm not sure if I heard him right, but I think he did support um, the bill, and I think um, it was quite gracious of you and the contribution you made in terms of suggesting that maybe not in the legislation, but in our action plan moving forward, that we encourage properties to ensure the upkeep um, of beaches and other sites and attraction elsewhere. Um, it, it's quite worthy. It's something that has been done to some measure, and certainly we, we can encourage it to be done a lot more than that than has been done. I heard some members, and certainly the case of the members from Soufre Fossa Jacques and Grosily spoke about where the real heartbeat of tourism is. And as a friend of mine said to me, um, the hat has two sides, the left and the right, so Soufre can take the left and Grosily can take the right. Mm -hmm. and, and both of them can have an equal claim um, to be in the, the heartbeat of you know, the, the tourism industry in St. Lucia. And Mr. Speaker, I think that the Prime Minister, in speaking, you know, pointed us to some fundamental issues and his own experiences and recollection of the tourism industry and his own vision and desire to see a tourism industry that can best connect with the people of St. Lucia, can best, you know, reflect the aspirations of the people of St. Lucia. And he made a very powerful statement, which I, I will repeat shortly. The member from Castle South East, of course, I, I recall him making the emphatic statement in relation to certification. He really described the approach that we want to use to certification. And that is the ministry saying to all tourism service providers that we will hold your hand and we will lift you up and ensure that you reach the necessary standards uh, of being world class, which is the dream that we all have for our destination. Mr. Speaker, the, the member from Miku South is a rather interesting representative in this House. He served in the Parliament of St. Lucia for five years as a Minister of Tourism. He was a Senator for five years. During those five years, for each year, the Honorable Member from Castries North, who was then Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, went to extraordinary lengths to ensure he had all the resources necessary to transform the tourism industry. The member from Castries North will tell you he got $50 million a year allocated to the tourism, the tourist board alone, not the Ministry of Tourism, $50 million to restructure reorganize, redesign tourism in this country. During those five years, not one hotel room was built in this country. Nothing. Not one heritage site was built in this country. Nothing. Instead, he spent millions providing guarantees to certain airlines. And I can tell you when a former Minister of Tourism, Don Fiofilas, came in, millions of dollars were owed to certain airlines. Millions. It took them about three years to pay out that debt. Three years. The $50 million he got a year for five years. A quarter of a billion dollars allocated. But he stands in this house and he has every answer for every problem in the tourism industry. He even speaks of how he wanted 
the hotel occupancy tax to be paid in a special account so they could fix up sidewalks and whatnot. He did not fix up one sidewalk when he was Minister of Tourism, not even in Rodney Bay. But he started Rodney Bay Village. Explain that to me. It's an enigma. It really is. How can someone who knows everything, especially about tourism, does nothing? <laughs> is it a psychological derangement? What, what is it? Is it an intellectual dishonesty? How can you have the answers for every single thing and you did nothing? I'm still trying to come to terms with that kind of thinking. And I want to go through some of them. How, Mr. Speaker? You probably, you were a former police officer, you used to profile persons. You probably can help me understand it, Mr. Speaker. How does that happen? And then you become Prime Minister for five years. Dragged into a six year. Into a six year. You did not build one hotel room. In fact, you lost hotel investments. Had to pay range almost $30 million. How do you have all the answers, but no actual work ever been done? Explain that to me. Explain that to me. Now, I love listening to the member, because in, in a way, it almost becomes comical. But how do you explain this? Five years as prime minister, five years as minister of tourism, and you cannot show slit for what you've done. He still wants us to be convinced that what he did in relation to Cabot and DSH were the most brilliant investment decisions in this country. He is not repentant. He is not going to say to the people of St. Lucia, I made a mistake. I should not have given away your thousand acres of land. I should not have given concessions that did not exist on the book, on the books and pass a special law to give cabinet the right to give those concessions. <laughs> the special amendment I'm speaking about, you may not even recall that you, you, you passed a special amend amendment in this house. There again, but you did, you did. So, so Mr. Speaker, how it is that you are still so convinced that those are the most brilliant decisions, that DSH was the best thing that ever happened to St. Lucia. Explain that to me. Explain it. And then he speaks of Sandy Beach and how I stopped community tourism on Sandy Beach. Now, I'll say a few things about community tourism. But I said I did have the photos of Sandy Beach and what he had proposed for Sandy Beach. And he said that's not true. And I will circulate it as a document of the House, with your permission, Honorable Speaker. How is it that someone who signed an agreement, took out photos, had it live on television for the entire nation to see, can so boldly stand up and say that it never happened? How? Now, I know the member from Roselle, or even himself will say, they had abandoned those plans, and they gave Invest and Lucia a new mandate to come up with alternative plans. But I will share something with this honorable house. One, you remember recently he boasted that DSH was going to take us to court and sue us. DSH didn't reveal it to the world because the two parties were talking, trying to resolve differences, but he announced it to the world. And he announced it the weekend after he held a UWP fundraiser in one of the tents at DSH. You remember this? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, you remember it? So he, Mr. Speaker, signed an agreement with DSH. And one of the reasons that DSH is asking or stating the, 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 the discontent and they being aggrieved is because a supplementary agreement was signed with him to allow them to do this to Sandy Beach. That's a sign. <laughs> so he signed it. He signed it. And DSH, in their statement of discontent, is saying they signed an agreement to do this to Sandy Beach, and it was not fulfilled. 
imagine that. He signed it. He signed to do this. And he stands in the house today and says he knows nothing about this. Now, tell me. Who signed it? He signed it. I can't tell you whether the member from Strozel Saltibus signed it as well. I know he signed the first one. But I cannot tell you thereafter. He signed both of them. He signed both of them. Yeah. So tell, explain to me, Honor, Mr. Speaker, how can you stand up in this house knowing that you signed an agreement with the SA to do this to Sandy Beach, to deny it? Even when I told you I had the photos, you still denied it. And then you accused me of stopping a community tourism project on Sandy Beach. Is this a community tourism project? Out. Member for Migu South. Don't walk out there. Member no, for Migu South. Order, uh, order or so investigation? Speaker, I stand on a point of order. What is your point of order? In, mm -hmm. in order um, is the member misleading the house. Mr. Speaker, this was a presentation that was made to cause the government to want to give this piece of property. Um, okay. I, I, sorry. Go member ahead. for Migu South. My um, If you stand on a point of order, you say the member is misleading the house. Just say, you know. What did he say to cause him to mislead the house? That's what I'm saying. Go ahead. So I'm saying that the member is su su suggesting that this was a contracted deal. A presentation was made in order for them to get this piece of land. Okay? We gave them, we gave them il parata and not this piece of land. And the member knows well that by the time he got into office, all the plans had been drawn up, Mr. Speaker, for all the land behind the concrete road. Okay? Subdivision was done, Mr. Speaker, and you, when you drive in the south, you'll see the two signboards are, are still up there talking about that particular project. So how he wants to bring anything in with regards to DSH, he can show as many pictures as he wants to, but the fact is when he got into office, the deal that was on the table was for Invest and Lucia to develop that land, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Member. Um, you said that the member was misleading the house. What I, I was, what I gathered from what the member said, um, from this picture, um, was that, as you rightfully said, a presentation was made. Um, so I don't take it that the member was misleading the house. I have no difficulty, Mr. Speaker, if that's what he said. But the reality is giving the impression, Mr. Speaker. No, it's what he said. Is not we 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 cannot. Um, I can only I can only deal with what the, the member said. I cannot deal with, with what you or what you think is inferring. The member said that a presentation was made, and then they made mention of the concrete road and what happened, and he showed the picture to show exactly what the presentation showed. Um, I cannot take it to mean that uh, what you're saying. The, the member did not see it. So, member for Castries South. Continue. Would you suggest okay, that the so member is sorry, Mr. Speaker. Sorry, Mr. Speaker. So Mr. Hold on, Speaker. hold on, member for cast yourself. Um, the member is insinuating that this is what the deal was and that I, that I lied and that there was never a deal for um, Invest and Lucia to do the, the, uh, the Sandy Beach site. And that's all I'm asking for. So we can, there, they can two can coexist and have no difficulty with that. But please do not give the impression that when he got into office, that the Sandy Beach site was in the possession of Invest in Lucia. All the designs and everything else were done, and it was, in fact, he and his, his the minister decided not to proceed with that project. Member, again, I'll say, um, the member for Castry South, um, if my memory serves me well, said that you said there was a community tourism project for um, Viewfort, and the picture circulated document that was made a document of the house. Said that does not indicate that this is a community tourism project. Um, I don't, my rule is that I don't think that the member is misleading the house. So thank you. Continue, member, for. So, Mr. Speaker, so, Mr. Speaker, you know, I, I didn't want to go deeper. I didn't want, I did not want to go deeper into this matter. I did not want to. I wanted to make my point and to move on. But I want you to listen to this, Mr. Speaker. The member from Miku South is saying that I, as minister, decided to stop. Now, I can say for the record, I have never been part of such a decision. I have never. I am not aware that any of my staff at the ministry 
participated in such a decision, and I am not aware that Invest got any such instructions from anyone to do so. And one of the reasons why I can say so quite clearly is because I never even had any reason to consider what was proposed for, for Sandy Beach. And the reason is clear. And the Prime Minister can tell you. When we came into office, one of the first meetings we had was with DSH and the principals of DSH. And they said to us quite clearly what their thinking was on the DSA development, including the fact that they had been given those lands for that development and it was taken away from them. And the member from Catrice is can say so. So DSA is saying to us that we signed an agreement in the last government, they gave us copies of it, told us that they would have an issue with the government of St. Lucia because it was given to them and taken away from them. At that point, there's nothing we have to consider about Sandy Beach anymore. In fact, they went on to tell us a lot of things about the way your government dealt with them. A lot of things. But you will stand up and accuse people. You will stand up and accuse people. And I'll tell you, you have a very nefarious reputation. I can tell you that. But let's not go there today. Today is a glorious day for us. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not, no, seriously, I'm not going to expose you on a day like today. But we meet investors who tell us a lot of things. At that meeting, they told us a lot of things about your government and how it operated. But don't get me started today. Don't let me get started. Because there's a reason why you dislike GPH, but we'll come to that at another time. Mr. Speaker, not today is not the day for this. Mr. Speaker, you will stand here and accuse me of stopping a community tourism project on Sandy Beach when you sign an agreement giving away Maria Island and Sandy Beach, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, allow me to move on. Mr. Speaker, again, member, or the mem members misleading. Hold on, hold on. Member for um, Castro South, can you see? Member for Miko South, what is your point of order? The member is misleading the House. There was never agreement, Mr. Speaker, to give anybody Maria Island. So I would like him to withdraw that statement. There's no truth to that matter. Thank you, Member for Miko South. Member for um, Castro South, member is saying that there is no you just made mention that you know, he gave away Murray Island or he sold Murray Island. He's saying that there was never any deal to sell Murray Island. You know, I, I, Mr. Speaker, you uh, know, you, the member stood up, accused me of stopping a project and said all kinds of things about me. I'm uh, the minister and his reputation and whatnot. Blues, I take it. My shoulders are broad, but you like a shin. Yeah. Member, you only call a shin, yeah, Popot. Member for like Miku South. Shin, yeah. You understand? You come here, you accuse people. Yeah. I'm in public life, and I expect that I'll be accused from time to time. I will member be accused. For South. I take my blows, and I move on. And I just remember the truth. Member for Miku South. Sorry, you. Member for Miku South. For Castro South. The member for. Miku South stood on a point of order, and he made mention that you um, indicated that Maria Island was given away, and he said that this ne that never happened under his watch, and if you cannot prove that he gave away Maria Island, I would appreciate if you can withdraw that statement. Mr. Speaker, I can go and stop this house and go and get the documents in my office to show you the supplementary agreement that was signed, but that's not necessary. The point has been made. If you want me to withdraw, I will withdraw. But I will not ask you to withdraw what you said about me. I will not. Because it just exposes, it just exposes the character that you are. But you know what? Let's move on. Member for Castro South, can you withdraw this statement? Mr. Speaker, I've, I've told you I've withdrawn it. No, no. You say if you want me to withdraw, I'll withdraw. You've not said that you withdraw okay, your Mr. statement. Mr. Speaker, I've withdrawn. Thank you very much, Member for Castro South. Carry on. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> 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 Mr. Speaker, I respect the presiding officer. But let me. <laughs> but I will tell you, your days are short lived up there. <laughs> because you will be sorted very shortly. And you will not have the luxury anymore to say. To, to, to say. But anyway, on a, on a serious note, Mr. Speaker. So let's, let's move on. Um, that, 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 enough of this, Mr. Speaker. Because I can say a lot more. 
about DSH and CARBOT, Mr. Speaker. But, you know, let, 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 let's move on. So, the member from Miku South in his presentation says that we are pretending that we are doing something new. This is not new. And that as far back as when he was director of tourism, there was the let be the best campaign. And they wanted every gas attendant, every ordinary person to be part of the whole tourism construct. Now, he may be right. I, I won't contest that. But the fundamental difference between you and how you view tourism and how we do is that we do not see solutions as just being subjects in the industry. We see them as being active participants benefiting from it and owning it, Mr. Speaker. That is fundamental. That is fundamental. Because for you, St. Lucian's participation in the industry is, you know, is not the same value we place at it. We have two different ideological and philosophical concepts. So you think of let's be the best because St. Lucians are supposed to smile and you know just <laughs> be, be, be how do you call it not, not servants of the industry we want St. Lucians to own it we want visitors to come in to invest to make profits but we want St. Lucians also to invest and make profits so there, there's a fundamental difference you did not invent you know community tourism why do you want to come and pretend that you were the one who invented it you were the one who invented community tourism in St. Lucia? I mean, come on, let, let, let's get real. I can say to you, Mr. Speaker, that this tourism development bill is not my work, it's not cabinet's work. This has been a journey. It's an evolution of the tourism industry, Mr. Speaker. Many individuals have contributed to the development of this construct. It did not start with me. I know very little about tourism. Very little. I'm not a guru. The member Miku South, that's the guru. Because he told us about he working with Chris Blackwell and he built Miami Beach and he did uh, Jamaica and all those things he did, Mr. Speaker. I cannot boast of that. I'm, I can't. But I know I'm a fast learner. I know I ask a lot of questions and I know how to work as part of a team. And I know I have a team in cabinet and in the ministry that is pushing the industry forward, Mr. Speaker. So I will not stand here and boast that community tourism started with me or anything like this. The member spoke of community tourism and what is needed is investment in community tourism. We should not just be talking about it, we have to invest in it. And I wondered, is something wrong again if the member from Miku South? And then I remembered at the last sitting, he walked out. Like a real Shinya, he walked out. He did not stay and face, face it. And therefore, he may have missed the debate that we had on the borrowing for community tourism and all the projects we'll be investing in. He would have missed all the discussions about the plans we have for more investment. He would have missed the report I give about what we have done so far. And then he would have fully appreciated that we are investing massively in community tourism. Massively. So when he speaks about his investment we need, we are displaying investment in community tourism. We are the ones that passed the legislation. We are the ones that started the institution. Not him. Let me remind you, he was prime minister. Five million dollars was spent on community tourism or at least part of it allocated and part of it spent. Show us the track record of what did you do in five years with that $5 million. Show us when you speak of investing and lecturing us, you had a chance five years. And I heard yesterday in the Senate, the former Minister of Tourism was grandstanding and showing slides, as usual, showing slides. I have a simple message for him, simple. And I'm not going to engage in no big argument with any petrol and child. You know, because that's how he behaves. But I'm not going to do that. But then he goes on and he says a lot of things. All I can say to him, when you speak to the people in ancillary canneries, they say and they express their disappointment that 
the raffin tour that's offered was supposed to be a community tourism project and it did not end up as a community tourism project and that at some point the full story will come out and who is the person behind it who is the person promoting it who claims to be in charge of it and I will also say the last time I went answer away somebody told me go at the bamboo raft inside and all the tables and chairs and um, food silvers and things I see there all of those things were bought under community tourism now I will ask the ministry to give me an account on this. I have not done it yet. But if you want to step out of line Mr. with your Speaker, accusations... On a point of order, the member is not in the House. We're not supposed to be making aspersions against anybody who is not a member of the House, Mr. Speaker. Go ahead, member. You want me to sit, Mr. Speaker? Yeah. Now, let me be very careful with my words, huh? Very careful with my words. I said yesterday in the Senate, he said a lot of things. And as a member of the parliament, he will have an opportunity to present an account of what has happened. Because, you know, we, 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 we can govern and we can, we can stand here and we can debate, we can argue. But when people start making accusations and they cross that, that line, they have to be made to account. So when we're going to talk about community tourism, I have never asked the ministry to give me any detailed report on what has happened with the five million dollars and what was done in community tourism. I accepted we have to move on. What was there? What was there? We will build on it, we will improve it, and we will move forward. The same project in ancillary canneries would tell me we had to look for an additional one million dollars to get a sewer system in place so it can become functional. You, and you're telling me you master planners, master executors of projects? Seriously? But we will prepare to let all those things go by. Let all those things go by and let's move on. Make sure the community gets what they need and they can benefit from it. And forget, forget those scenes. Three years, you had five years. You had six years. Six years and you did not even do it properly. You did not even do it properly. Mr. Speaker. How many hotels you, you know, the member from Miku South said, what we really need to make St. Lucia successful, what we really need to make St. Lucia successful is to have brand St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, everywhere you go, people will tell you, we present brand St. Lucia. Export, Tourism Authority, CIP, Invest. We go wrong, we promote brand St. Lucia. Export under the Minister from Commerce, a member for um, Soufre, for Sejac, and we present Brand St. Lucia. Brand St. Lucia is not even new to us. It is something that's been spoken about for years. The first time I heard it being expressed in terms of how we implement it was under Dr. Kenny Anthony. You know, that's how far back that goes. It's not new to us, and maybe somebody else, even before, might have mentioned it. We will not proclaim that we are the owners of that idea. But the fact is, we are doing it. You had five years or six years as Prime Minister, and you did not do it. So yes, the Brand St. Lucia idea is an excellent one. We will build on what we've done before. We will continue to work together, and we'll continue to promote St. Lucia as a special experience, whether in investment, in tourism, in CIP, and in whatever field of endeavor because we believe it is the right way. So thank you very much for affirming what we all accept. But please do not come and pretend that that's what we should do. And we're not doing it. We are doing it. The member said what we really need in St. Lucia. He gave a long pontification about you know, flights and rooms and what's most important. I mean, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But I, I want to say to him, I recall sitting across there and his first budget address, he spoke about all the hotels that will be built in St. Lucia. First policy statement. And then we laughed among ourselves and we were reminded that during the by-election campaign in, Mi in Miku, he promised he would have built, how many hotels member from Castries is? Seven. Seven hotels. He promised that 
he, as Minister of Tourism, would build seven hotels in Miku, probably. In, yeah? Yeah, he in Maiku, he would build seven hotels in Maiku. <laughs> seven hotels. He did it during the by elections in Miku, and not one was built. Maybe in Maiku North, but not in Maiku South. It wasn't built there. But Mr. Speaker, as Prime Minister, he stood up right there. There. And he said how many hotels he will build over the next five years. He, in an interview with Rick Wynn, his good friend, my friend too, but he's a good friend, said he was bringing $2 billion worth of investment the following year in St. Lucia. U.S. U.S. Wasn't easy? U.S. Me, none. <laughs> but he said that. Of the hotels you said you were going to build in your first policy statement, how many were built? None. I'm glad you're saying none. Of the $2 billion investment you will bring in the following year. And when he said $2 billion, Requin actually said, $2 billion? He said, yeah, $2 billion. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so that's what he said he would build. I can say to you, honorable member from Miku South, that many of the projects which were stalled, some of them started under Kenya Anthony. Um, I don't want to give my, <laughs> my friend from Srozel some more stuff. <laughs> go, go ahead. You know, some of the projects that were stalled, we've engaged the developers. We put them back on track. In the case of Carbot, we express our views on the development, what our challenges were, what our thoughts were, and we've tried to reorient it to make sure it serves the benefit of the people of St. Lucia. So we have tried, Mr. Speaker, and we've also reached out to, uh, we've got new investors that will be investing substantially in St. Lucia. That, Mr. Speaker. And over the next few months, St. Lucians will see a number of projects that will be started in St. Lucia. So you would have spent five years as Minister of Tourism, six years as Prime Minister, and not built one hotel room. Galaxy. Can I, can I say something to the Honorable House about Galaxy? You know, there we go. You don't want me to say it? Okay, I would say it. But Mr. Speaker, you know, everything he touches fails. Fails, Mr. Speaker. But he stands there and he lectures us. Lectures us. He lectures the member from Brazilian Minister of Sports about the certification of the Sufre Stadium. How do you have the gall to do this when this has been a total disaster? Don't you have any shame of people resurrecting all your skeletons? You don't have shame. Okay, fine. So, Mr. Speaker, you know. Mr. Speaker, maybe the member from Microsoft should learn to just leave some things alone and allow us to continue to develop the country as best as we can. Because I was honestly thought the member would come here and give a real, robust, rigorous analysis of the bill and shortcomings and where we can improve it, what not. And I, told, I, I must admit I was a little bored during the presentation because there was nothing of substance in terms of the response to the bill. So maybe you should just leave those things alone, Mr. Mr. Speaker, and please advise him to do so. Mr. Speaker, I want to say something about two things before I finish. Two. The incentives. And he raised an issue about, and I know there's a lot of talk going around about it, 50% um, incentives, and there'll only be 50% you know, incentives given. And maybe the fault was mine. I didn't explain it properly, but you can appreciate the amount that I had to see, and I was trying to be quick and gloss over as many of the issues as possible. So I didn't give it sufficient attention to explain it. And Mr. Speaker, the legislation provides for generality in terms of you know, what's required for somebody to get concessions. It speaks of the different um, schedules, whatnot. But it doesn't go into the details. Those things are left for the regulations. The regulations are not in force until the legislation has been passed and the minister signs the order for the regulations to come into effect. So, first of all, his suggestion that this piece of legislation 
is repealing existing legislation and there will be nothing existing is wrong. It's wrong. There will be a date by which a new legislation come into force. So until then, the old still apply. And when the new legislation comes into force, the minister signs the order for the regulations that will accompany the new legislation. If he looks at clauses 154, 155, 156, it speaks of the transitioning phase and it gives you clear guidance on those issues, if he looks at it. So anybody who's in applying for concessions between now and the date when the new legislation comes into force will be treated as if they applied under the old. It's in the legislation. It's very clear. Apparently he didn't read it. Member for South. Again, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm going to be happy to be corrected, but on a point of order, the member is misleading the House. In the document itself, Mr. Speaker, on page 88, section repeal 155, the following acts are repealed. The Tourism Incentives Act, the Tourism Stimulus and Investment Act, and the Tourism Levy. It then goes on, Mr. Speaker, and says the savings, what's going to be hold, held over. It says, from the commencement of the, of the subject of the act, incentives issued under the Tourism Incentive Act. So tour, incentives that were already issued, Mr. Speaker, um, or Tourism Stimulus and Incentive Act, Cap 1503, continue to be valid for the period for which the incentives were approved. The rate of tourism levy, so it says nothing about that, Mr. Speaker. So I would certainly it like- It says nothing to, about what? It says nothing about the regulations being held over. It says that the acts have been repealed and when it speaks of the savings, this is page 88, okay, it only speaks to incentives that were given that they now continue, they're grandfathered in would be the term. But there's nothing here that specifically says that the schedule of incentives that existed under those acts are being saved. I don't know. They, 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 maybe... I, I don't understand what, what you said really. Any, any concessions you bought under the old act, you will continue to enjoy it. Yes. yes. That's not what the member said. What the member, may I, Mr. Speaker, I apologize. Mr. Speaker, what remember. the member said yeah. is that the schedule that of the regulations would have continued to be in play. There's nowhere in that document. Who said that so? Said no. You did. Who said so? So then, so then, so you're telling me that you've repealed the act, and exactly it's what I said is 100 percent accurate. In repealing the act, then the incentives as we know them have been repealed. So if I want to apply for new incentives tomorrow, what guides me? Where is it, Mr. Mr. Speaker? I will read. I will read for you again. You, you read 157. Have you, have, you read, have you read clause 157? Read 157. Read it aloud so all of us can hear. Read it aloud. Member sorry, for sorry, Cast Yourself. You will speak through the speaker and you will not give orders okay, to Mr. all speaker. the members <laughs> of this honorable house. <laughs> Go ahead, member. So, Mr. Speaker, the Act provides for persons who have made. In other words, okay, let, let, let me put it differently. Honorable member, let me try and explain it differently to you. So, if you look at clause one, the act shall come into force on a date to be fixed by the minister by order published in the Gazette. So until then, the old legislation continues. No? Mr. Speaker, may I? Mr. Speaker. Member, member. Speaker, what are you standing on? What on, are you standing on? The point on? Of order that what is the point of order? That we're still misleading the House. In what way is the member misleading the House? Sorry, Mr. In what way is the member misleading the House? Because so what have you said to mislead the House? making reference to Section 157 and suggesting that that section answers the question. It doesn't. If you read what it says here, the application made for incentives. So if there's an application that's in place today that has not been approved, right? The Tourism Stimulus Investment Act that has not been finally determined before the, the commencement of the act is deemed to have been made under this act. 
Right. So, so what? But on the, if I'm going to fly under this act, if I'm going to fly under this act, that's what I'm saying. Where are the details? In the, if I have 10 rooms, what can I expect to get? The same schedule that the member is speaking of, which I agree. And that's why I look for it. I said there is nothing in the schedules that highlight specifically what are going to be the incentives we get. What the Prime Minister read, Mr. Speaker, was headings. But in the old act, it says, if in fact you have anywhere between 10 and 50 rooms, this is how much uh, corporate tax you're going to get away. This no, no, is how much of the other tax uh, uh, that have you're going to be and not have to pay. And also the VAT. But there's nothing here. There's nothing in the schedule. So what it okay. means is exactly what I said, Mr. Speaker. A person is to apply, put it in, and with no expectation or understanding what they're going to get. That's a level of discretion okay. that should not be allowed. That's that all. Okay, okay. Mr. Mr. Speaker, can I, in the interest of moving forward, yes. we'll refer you to the legal persons and they will. I don't want to go back and forth with the Honorable Member on interpretation. No, Mr. Speaker. Go ahead, Member. Yeah, can, can I go ahead? Okay. That has not been finally determined on that decision. So if it's finally determined, then you think that it's not been finally determined. The team is not being on the act. All right, Mr. Speaker. All right, can we can we can we agree to disagree? And we can always ask the legal person to so take a look at it and give some worthy consideration to the point that you raise it. Thank because you, I, 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 I'm not a, a lawyer, I can only give you the interpretation I have and the advice I'm given. If you believe your interpretation your, is better or, or correct, I will allow them to, to, to resolve it. So, but can we move on? Member for Castro South, can you continue with the presentation? Yeah, can I continue? So, Mr. Speaker, I was making the point that the real details would lie in the regulations. Now, let, let us look at the previous pieces of legislation that existed. And Member from Mikusau, I wish you would really listen to me. I don't want us to have to go through this because you said I said something which I did not say. So, so here it is. Under the previous legislation where because he, he raised the question that in this legislation it is not specific what you're getting and we're saying to him the specificity will be in the regulations in the regulations because in the old piece of legislation it says you will get up to a hundred percent you will get up to a hundred percent of a b c d the danger when putting this in the legislation is that the exact quantum you get is not measured by any objective criteria. So if you apply, Mr. Speaker, somebody in cabinet can decide we're going to give you 75% we've on corporation tax for 10 years. And, and they're fully entitled to do so. If somebody else apply and not favored by cabinet, they can decide they're giving you 25% for five years. No, no, listen. That's why I tell you, listen attentively. Listen attentively. Because there was no transparency in how the previous incentives and concessions were given. It said up to 100%. But please, let me just finish. Can I just ask you, Honorable Member, to let me finish? And then you'll ask whatever question you want, yeah? So. Mr. Speaker, sorry, Mr. Speaker, can you ask the Honourable <laughs> Member to just allow me to, 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 to finish? So in the previous legislation, the discretion was that of Cabinet and no objective criteria. Ladies and gentlemen sit around a table and they just said, give me 25 percent, even 50 percent, because there was no objective criteria. And all of us sit, we, you were in Cabinet, we sat, let, let me, okay, let me tell you how a vulgar and obscene it got. Let me tell you how vulgar and obscene it got. By this very member from Miku South, a particular developer, and everybody will know who I, I have to mention names, applied for concessions. Concessions were given. When it went to the AG chambers, they said they could not publish it because it was not in keeping with the law. Think about that. And then, you know what they did? Came into this house and amended the law to say that cabinet can give extras if they want to give extras. 
tell me about it. That's how vulgar and obscene it became. That cabinet, in its deliberate judgment, Member for Miku South. Mr. Speaker, on a point of order, the member is grossly misleading the House. Okay. If he wants to give that example, the same thing can be said of the economic. No, what did no member? The mem the member is misleading the House yes, because in, in the incentives, Mr. Speaker, it clearly outlines X number of rooms, X number of level of investment, X number of jobs. That is what establishes the criteria to determine what incentives a person gets. If in fact cabinet, maybe the cabinet he was belonging to, wants to go away from that. But the parameters of what incentives to give based on the level of investment, the level of jobs, and the size of the hotel. All those things are the criteria. That is what I'm looking for. That is what I'm not seeing in the new act. Now, if in fact, Mr. Speaker, that the members have not Mr. done Speaker, that as yet, this is and the intention to that, no Member, problem. on a point of order, you stand, you say what the point of order is. You've made your statement, and then you take your seat. Member for Castro South, um, the member is saying that um, there are clear parameters as to what level of, of um, incentives that a person can get. Um, we're, I'm saying what the member is saying, a member for Castro South. He's saying that there are clear parameters um, and it's not, a, it's not a discretionary issue as it relates to incentives. Mr. Speaker, from the, the, the I may be wrong, but the, the, member, the staff from the AG Chambers are here and from the Ministry of Tourism. I am not aware of any piece of legislation that says if you create X amount of jobs, you spend X amount of money, this is what you get. I, I am not familiar with that piece of legislation. I am not. And if the Honorable Member from Miku South has such legislation, it is his private legislation. This is private legislation. So as far as I know, this is not how it is stated in the TSIA and the TIA. So I don't know where the member from Microsoft got that from. But I gave you the example of a developer that was given, and that's fact, incentives that the AG Chambers, whilst he was Prime Minister, said they could not publish it. And that he came to this Honorable House and had an amendment to give Cabinet the right to give extras. I can also tell another developer who was virtually not um, rejected on most of what he asked for, but he still proceeded with the project, and today he's still trying to get redress because of how he was treated by the last government. And this is what we are going to remove. It's going to be transparent and it will have an objective criteria. So in the regulations, Mr. Speaker, that we have shared, shared with the major stakeholders, the regulations, so I can give you an example, Mr. Speaker. Just one example, because it's quite a lengthy document, the regulations. So I'll give you one example. And I want those, he's already sent messages too, that we're only giving 50% concessions, so listen carefully as well. Say, tourism accommodation. Say, a first-time construction of a tourist accommodation and its initial furnishing and equipping. Investment size, up to five million, and that's where most solutions would apply um, for. Across all the incentives, they will get 100%. Import duty, excise duty, VAT, stamp duty, income tax, corporate tax, property tax, vendor tax, withholding tax, they will get 100%. But well, it has various periods. But it's clearly stated, anybody can then invest know exactly what they will get. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Now you're changing your story. Let me go on. From five member, million and one dollar to twenty for, million. Remember for uh, Castro South, you have fifteen minutes to conclude okay, your Mr. presentation. Speaker, I'll, I'll finish you. by then. So for five million to twenty million, import duty hundred, excise duty hundred, VAT hundred, stamp duty hundred, income tax fifty percent. It's not automatic hundred. Corporate tax fifty percent, property tax fifty percent. Then you go to twenty million plus. Import duty 100, excise duty 100, VAT 100, stamp duty 50, income tax 50 up to 15 years. So you have a table that clearly states for each activity, investment activity, not only accommodation, every single investment opportunity is listed there, every single one. We fit the investment size in terms of the quantity and it states what percentage you will get. And as I stated in my presentation, 
where you have 50% under certain of the incentives, you can get the additional ones according to your commitment to certain principles. You, 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 you understand? It means any investor coming to St. Lucia, any St. Lucia, and may I say, most of the investment opportunities that St. Lucians engage in through our historical data, they will maximize incentives and concessions. Okay? But what it does, and where it will eat at the member, is that anybody coming into the country or any St. Lucian investing cannot be discriminated against anymore. It's a transparent, objective criteria of who gets what. You know what it does? And it's a very brave decision for politicians to have, to have made. Very brave. It reduces the discretion of politicians to decide who get incentives and benefits in this country. It is, it, which is why in the legislation a decision can be made that a committee in the ministry in the ministry can decide up to a certain amount the concessions that are granted because the table will say exactly what you can get. There will be very little space for discretion and politicians of this government actually took a decision to outline in a very transparent open way what are the benefits you will get when you come and invest? Nobody will hold anybody to ransom. Nobody will threaten anybody. And nobody will discriminate against anybody in this country when it comes to investment in the tourism sector. And politicians took that decision. It, I'm not saying there is absolutely no discretion. But the space for discretion is severely minimized. Severely minimized. And I know a piece of legislation like this, a progressive piece of legislation like this, can never be passed by a United Workers' Party government. Never. Because they thrive on discriminating against certain people and favoring others. And if some people don't like me for saying this, I'm sorry, it is the truth. All St. Lucians must feel, regardless of political persuasion, that they are treated fairly and squarely. And these regulations, when they are published, and we still probably have some tidying up to make, we still get in feedback on some of them, will be a public document, and not what that exists right now. So the member doesn't like it. And, and you have to really reflect on this, Mr. Speaker, that this member, when he wanted to give concessions, he gave beyond what the law said he could give. The AG Chambers in his own government said they could not publish it. He came to this house and he did an amendment so that the cabinet can give extras. Think about that abuse of power. This stop this. This stop this. So he cannot feel comfortable anymore. So, honorable member, we will de determine a date by which a new act will come into force and the minister will sign the order and the processes will take over. I'm not saying it is a perfect document. I can tell you it's guided by experience and historical data. We may have to amend it, we may have to modify it, but that's the nature of the, of the beast. We try to capture everything for every situation. And you know you will never totally get it that way. Never. So I am prepared to say that the regulations may have to be tweaked along the way until we approximate the very best practice. But this is a good start. And we are removing the stain of the Alan Chastney administration on investment climate in St. Lucia. So, Mr. Speaker, I think I have dealt with most of the issues. Is there any other issue, Mr. Speaker, you wish me to, to address? <laughs> so, in conclusion, Mr. Speaker, let me thank again the staff of the Ministry and of the St. Lucia Tourism Authority for the and the staff of the Attorney General Chambers. Um, I wish the member from Givot South was there today yeah. and to hear what he would say about the legislation. He did work with us in an earlier draft and give us some very valuable ideas as to how to improve it, Mr. Speaker. Um, a lot of what we have in there actually, you know, policy positions that he would have stated many years ago. But the staff did a fantastic job. They worked extraordinarily long hours on weekends, Mr. Speaker. Many a times they called me, asked me to bring pizza for them, which I did not always do, Mr. Speaker. 
Um, but they really worked hard, the AG chambers and the staff, to get this where it is, Mr. Speaker. They, they were really phenomenal in, in, in doing so. And I'm sure when people speak about tourism legislation in the region, St. Lucia will be cited as a best practice model of, of legislation. And, and Mr. Speaker, it will be due largely, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I want to be very clear on that, largely to the staff, the staff of the ministry and the AG chamber. What we did as cabinet and as minister was to provide general policy direction and tell them where we want the ship to sail. But they were the ones who are guiding it and, and managing the journey, Mr. Speaker. So I, I want us to be very appreciative of the, the work that what they did in this regard, Mr. Speaker. If there are any faults or errors in it, it's my fault and my colleagues because we did not review it sufficiently to correct them and to guide them, Mr. Speaker. I, I want St. Lucians to, to reflect on what we've achieved today, to reflect on what this government has been doing, the Youth Economy Agency, the MSME, Mr. Speaker, and the community tourism, and now this, as very clear statements of our faith and belief, belief in the capacity of St. Lucian's Lucia. We believe that our people have given the support, if given the legislative framework, if given the financial support, and if provided with the leadership can achieve great things. We're not a large country with huge natural resources, but we are determined people. We've produced among the best thinkers in the world, two Nobel laureates. We've produced many other outstanding technocrats throughout the region and internationally. We can achieve. We must have the faith and the belief that as a people, we can do so. And the role of this government is to provide that support, provide that leadership, so our people can be bold enough to take the steps to achieve. This piece of legislation is another step in, in doing so, to tell our people that the tourism industry, the engine of this economy, the act economic activity that brings in the most money into this country can belong to them. It can belong to them. And this offers them the opportunity to do so. The assistance we give for the Youth Economy Agency, the assistance for the Community Tourism Agency, what we're doing in sports, the semi-professional league, the high performance center, all those things are about saying to our people, you can do it. And the role of government is to create the enabling environment for you to succeed. Have faith, seize the opportunities, and let us make St. Lucia a much better place. Because we can do it. And we would have differences. I think today I clearly stated that there's a sharp divide between the United Workers Party, the opposition, and ourselves. There's a sharp, sharp divide in how we see St. Lucians and how we approach the development of this country. So, <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, as I end this debate, and I ask that we move on to committee stage, Mr. Speaker, I, I really want to tell you that I am proud of what we have done. And I look forward to St. Lucians making the best opportunity and the best use of the work that has been done. Thank you very much.